And that's the part we've got to pay attention to. If you're looking for proof of God in your near-death experience or somebody else's, I think you've got to look at the after effects. It's too synchronistic. It, it is not a, this is not a Kool-Aid drinking event here, guys. We all come back. We don't read each other's stuff even, and we all believe the same thing at the same time. It's not accidental. Don't waste a damn minute. You know, I mean, I don't know if this is, this is one common denominator I do every day. And it wasn't about, sometimes it's just about remembering, changing what human conditioning was. So here's how I do it. You got to accentuate the positive. Wow! I feel good. A little bit of feel good goes a long way. You're listening to Karen Swain, teacher of deliberate creation, accentuating the positive, showing you a way to a better life. Accentuating the positive, it's not just bad, it's sanity. Who in their right mind would accentuate anything else? If you feel like that's what you want to do. Hello and welcome to another show, Accentuating the Positive with Karen Swain. So wonderful to have you join us again. Today, I have another brilliant, magnificent, amazing man to introduce you to. His name is Robert Trembley. He is the author of 20 Seconds, A True Account of Survival and Hope. He sent me his book. Actually, he just said to me recently that it's been 52 weeks on the best-selling, best-selling Amazon in what category? Spiritual? Uh, actually, the, in, it's been in two different genres, uh, both the NDE genre and uh, our ironic genre is the HIV and AIDS genre. Oh, okay. 52 weeks. There you go. Number one for 52 weeks. Welcome to the show, Robert. Thank you, Karen, for having me. <laughs> Sorry so, for all the technical difficulties. Yeah, we've been like an hour trying to get some technical difficulties. <laughs> But anyway, we're here, we're here, we're both exhausted, but we've got water. Ah. Right, right. You call yours water, we call it different here in the United States, but that's all right. What do you call it? Juice. Beer. No. <laughs> all righty. So uh, you've sent me your book and I, I, I've had a look over it. And, and the thing that, it's actually exhausting reading it because the thing, the thing that struck me was, oh, my God, have you been on a journey? Yeah. I mean, illness after illness after illness. And I was just like exhausted reading it. How could one man endure so much pain? You know, it's, I hear that quite a bit about the read. It's either I couldn't put it down or I had to walk away a few times and just feel the emotion of it. It's. Um, you know, I often think about uh, a favorite quote from Jimmy V that, you know, I've always held on to all of my life. And it was, if you can laugh and if you can cry and if you can think in one day, that's a heck of a day. And uh, so I often refer to that with my book because there, there are times, as you probably found, where it's just hilariously comical because I honestly... I mean, even when I went through all the things I went through medically, I tried to do it in a comical version. And I even said in the book, I'm so sorry, we got to get through this. Let's do it with a little bit of <laughs> humor because it's, it is quite a resume. I mean, I have, I have literally had in the last three years, 10, 10 surgeries alone uh, for rectal cancer. And I mean, if you've had one, it's a nightmare. It is, even my doctor was like, you're going to hate me. It's savage. It's brutal. It is just not meant to happen. And, but you get through it. And uh, there were times in the first year of my treatment uh, alone in my apartment that it was, it, it wasn't day by day. It was hour by hour. And, uh, uh, you know, the goals were to, the next meal if I could even eat and I really wasn't eating. I had lost, uh, you know, a hundred pounds by the time I had quit and went into hospice. So, you know, I spent a lot of time looking out the window of, of my apartment and watching the seasons go by. And, uh, I often do think about that. How did you, you know, but it literally was some days just to the next event. And I guess, you know, part of my survival and part of the answer to your question was, 
I waited for the next person to show up. And, and I know that can be somewhat guttural and brutal, but uh, there are times when the sick and ill watch people run. And uh, the irony of my story wasn't in, was in understanding that that was the very aspect that helped me survive, was paying attention to who did show up and when they showed up and, and absolutely having a ton of gratitude for it. Well, I said your, your will to live is extraordinary. I mean, we've just had, I don't know, 45 minutes of technical difficulties. That's nothing to get over compared to what you've lived through. I mean, nothing. <laughs> no, you know, but I'm still a man and I'm still a whining, sniveling little thing when I get sick. Actually, I would say that you're a very different person. Well, you are a very different person because you go in, you, into who you were in your book uh, let's give people, I've got, now I've got the garbage trucks outside. I hope people can't hear them. Um, let's give people a bit of a snippet into your story. Of what happened? Who was Robert Tremblay before you got sick? How did you get sick? What happened? Let's start at the beginning. Uh, well, I guess just a short uh, description of my life. Uh, I was a military veteran. I was a, um, a combat infantry medic in the U S army. Um, and I was very passionate about that. I later became a helicopter paramedic. Um, but when I came out of the service, I, I immediately got involved in law enforcement. Uh, my family's been in law enforcement. Uh, my brother was a chief of police, retired, and the head of the state police in Vermont. Uh, but I was in New Hampshire, and I became a, a police officer and uh, accelerated very quickly in, in my career in law enforcement. And, and uh some people harrow this as a great accomplishment, but uh, when I was 23 years old, I was the youngest full-time chief of police in the country. And people go, oh, and I'm like, it doesn't mean I should have been, <laughs> but I was. Um, but, you know, I've always been kind of the go-getter, I guess, just full of ego and speed and uh, my family always said I had two speeds, a thousand miles an hour or dead stop. And um, I think it's probably apropos to who I really was. And uh, of course, you know, the army and helicopters and then a cop and then a chief of police. I became maybe not famous in a small town, maybe more notorious as a small town chief of police. But Or, or infamous. Uh, yeah, infamous is probably exactly <laughs> the right word. And, uh, <laughs> So, you know, all of this physical conditioning leads to a pretty big ego, honestly. And uh, um, I ended up becoming, I left law enforcement, uh, and this will kind of describe who I was as far as impact. Uh, my last official duties as chief of police in my town in New Hampshire uh, was I arrested the entire board of selectmen and the road agent for embezzlement and resigned the next day. So, you know, I was all about making an impact and, you know, sometimes that impact was a big wave. Sometimes it was a gentle one, but it was all full of ego. I, I, honestly, um, I found my way into uh, the banking industry as a private investigator, uh, became rapidly known as a guy who could find anybody. And I taught around New England uh, and then entered the automobile industry in the finance division uh, teaching people how to run dealerships and manage people and um, all about human conditioning and motivating people, energy, you know, even before I even understood what it meant. Um, and I spent 18 years making a, a truckload of money um, teaching people how to steal your money, honestly. Um, so uh, in the last eight years of that, I traveled around the country as a uh, national trainer and consultant. And then bang, uh, it lasted a couple of years. I started getting sick and I was never, um, I mean, I, I would go to a doctor if something was bleeding or hanging off of me. And uh, like a lot of men, I suppose these days, it, it, it just is, you know, the infantry taught you to rub dirt in it and, and move along. And uh, so I started getting sick. I started losing weight. I actually went to a doctor several times. We couldn't find what was wrong. Uh, by the time I had lost 65 pounds, uh, I was falling asleep at work, and I was running a multi-million dollar business, and uh, 
I literally lost my job for the first time in my life. A huge shot to my ego. It wasn't that I was sick and falling asleep at my job. It was losing my job. Uh, I made a ton of money and, and uh, honestly, just that was my career was what's next. What's the next challenge? And you know, so I, I, I ended up in a, in a hospital room in North Carolina with lesions all over my leg. It's, mm -hmm. and, None of the doctors could find what was wrong, and uh, so I ended up in an emergency room in front of a 24-year-old uh, resident um, who gave me my final diagnosis, and uh, it was <laughs> it was a shocker for sure. It was literally a 20-second moment of holy cow, and uh, so yeah, that's pretty much how it all happened. So you were diagnosed with AIDS. Yeah. Yeah, sitting in that room with my wife of 10 years. Um, and this poor 24-year-old resident had never told anybody in their life that they were terminal. So this was a, her first experience with it. And, and I remember, it's almost appalling to me now. I've obviously forgiven myself, but this will tell you volumes about why I chose to write this book and why I do what I do. But when I was diagnosed with end-stage AIDS. It wasn't HIV, it wasn't AIDS, it was end-stage AIDS. Uh, I literally uh, was tested so late because they, quote unquote, wasn't in the risk factor. Yeah. Which is ironic in the sense that, you know, today 47% of the HIV population are actually females, ages 13 to 24. Um, 13 to 24. Factor. Yeah, in prime childbearing years. So, is that in know, the West or is that in uh, like that's Asia? Worldwide. That's, that's worldwide. worldwide. Um, there are certain states in this country that are even worse. Uh, but it's a piece of the puzzle that I suspect has been stuffed in a corner or maybe a box from 35 years ago. This clearly was outlined, detailed, whether we like to talk about it or not. Um, even I did as it's a gay disease. And if you weren't gay, it really wasn't something you needed to consider. And, and, you know, I think a lot of us rationalized it to the degree where, you know, back then, 35 years ago, there was nothing you could do with the disease. You watched people die. Um, and just like what we talked about earlier, that, that is an awkward position for the human being to watch. They don't know what to do. I've watched family members. I've watched people who love me who just can't deal with it. And, and we have to understand it. Um, and we have to forgive it and appreciate it. But um, I do talk about it in the sense that, to me, one of the things that helped me survive was human connection and human connectivity and, and love for all intensive purposes. And not to oversimplify it, but it's the truth. So I want to be able to talk about it without fault or blame. Um, that we do have a tremendous amount of power when we show up in life and, and we can all sit and pray and meditate about it. And I think that's an important part of the deal. But, you know, one of the, one of the aspects of your prayers answered is that you can actually get up and do something. Um, so, you know, that was a big part of my journey for sure. And a big part of my story was, was dealing with the humility of, and, and this disease isn't exactly, you know, this is still the one disease where when you tell people that's what you have, the first question out of their mouth, Karen, is how did you get that? <laughs> you know, and, and it's a condition thing. And, uh, you know, similar to cancer where people will say, well, where is it? You know, almost like they're searching for a reason to, I'm sorry, but to subconsciously write you off a little bit. Uh, so, you know, we found that the, the evolution of the disease and, and, you know, the irony was when this 24-year-old woman told me I was dying with six weeks to live, a part of it was I didn't even have health insurance. Mm. You know, that's a, yeah, that was a new thing for me, but a, a relevant issue in today's day and age when we're sitting here struggling with... Well, it is in the States, but not in Australia. No, and bless your heart for reminding us Americans of... Uh, yeah, you know, like I was hit by a truck and bleeding on the side of the road, and went to hospital, had two operations, and I, it didn't even cost me the price of a paper. Yeah, it was all uh, covered by the government. Um, and uh, you should probably come speak to our United States Senate and Congress. It's, uh, 
it was well, that's another year. story but what i want to say to you is okay so what's amazing about this story is that not that you got sick but that you recovered yeah <laughs> and and you're healthy and changing the world today and your experience you know yeah like why you recovered and your experience yeah in spirit or on the other side or in a different dimension or out of your body or whatever you want to call it. And, um, and, and what I'm hearing as I'm listening to you is that you sounded like a really fun guy and you sounded like the pillar of your community and you sounded like someone that people would revere and say, yeah, this is a fun guy. This is a go getter. He's a doer. He's a law enforcement. You know, there was, I mean, you talk about ego, but when we're talking because I think what's happening on our planet is that source or the powers that be or our higher selves or whoever you want to call it, God, is asking humanity to look at the way they use their beautiful thing called ego, which is the part of us that creates separation and identity yeah. and gives us a human experience. But we get so lost in the ego and then something like a truck hits you <laughs> Literally, it could be a disease or it could be a truck or it could be whatever, a death of a loved one. And you'd start to completely reassess who you are and how you operate in the world. And this is what's happened to you, although you still have that, like, you know, like sparky energy that you always had. Yeah, you know, everybody would say, if I walked into a room, you knew I walked into a room. Yeah. You know, and, and, I, and I don't think that's actually changed. It's just a different vibrate, you know, vibration in how I do it. And, you know, I don't <laughs> want the ego to get lost. I mean, yeah. you know, the ego is a beautiful thing. It's a healthy part of our, our existence and, and yeah. keeps us moving and keeps us striving and makes us who we are. So I didn't. Yeah completely shed my ego and yeah. and quite honestly I don't think I'd ever been 52 weeks on the bestseller list without it so yeah. it's okay to embrace it it's yeah. just you know when I say ego I'm probably misdefining it in the sense that everything I did although I was in public service was about my own success and and today my entire life is about helping as many as I can as long as I can and as hard as I can you know, the irony about my survival, and, and we keep hearing about these miracles and these spiritual awakenings and these people are having miracles. And I often wonder when we're going to stop calling them miracles when they happen 50,000 times a year. <laughs> but, but, you know, the, the part with even the Mayo Clinic, who's one of my doctors, was, you know, we always fall back, and this is exactly what they said, we always fall back on these spontaneous remissions and these miracles with boy, that immune system, we just don't know, you know, the capability of the immune system. We're really infancy, at the infancy level of the immune system. But your story really pisses us off. Because, <laughs> you know, if you can get past the, the, the trees to the forest in my story and get past the stigma of it, when I was diagnosed, I had no functioning immune system at all. It's so, you know, we have people dying every day with a fully functioning immune system. And so how is it you survive multiple terminal diagnosis, multiple cancers, multiple diseases, tuberculosis? I mean, it, the, the list is, and as you said in the book, it's endless and, and exhausting. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, I've got to bring you there to realize how far we've come in, yeah. in standing in this arena every day and, and just trying to shake people out of the physical, mental conditioning that this 35-year-old disease captioned as the gay disease never was. And, and if the fact that 47% of females in the second fastest growing population are senior citizens in this country, it's senior citizens, your parents, it's our grandparents. Um, as the gay population numbers decrease, thank God, you know, the advocations worked. Um, but at some point, 35 years ago, we, we did this because we couldn't do anything about the disease. We watched people die. Well, Today, that's what we thought. Yeah. You come a long way with the disease. You can live a I mean, normal life. You know, the AIDS disease, it started in, it started in Africa. It started in families yeah. in Africa. Yeah. How, it, how it affected the gay community, I don't know. Yeah. But the fact that it did, I mean, Hay House, you know, the beautiful Louise Hay has just left yeah. the planet. 
she started counselling gay men who felt so ostracised. So these tragedies, have, there's like a greater purpose for everything, just like there was a greater purpose for your experience, personal experience because now look what you're doing. You're inspiring yeah. people all over the world. You're talking about something that people didn't feel safe to talk about. You're right. exposing fear because when people, you know, are scared of something, they like bury it and you're bringing that fear up to the surface. So, you know, it has its purpose. I mean, yeah. AIDS as a, as, a, as a disease has had its purpose it really in, has. You're in shining right. the light into the world. And Louise Hay, you know, yeah. was one of those huge lights. And then she went on to inspire millions of other people. Yeah. And she knew from the inception that this might have been the only terminal disease that we didn't, that, that actually could have been changed by human consciousness and education. Every disease could be changed by that. It, it, and you're, you're right, but it, it tugs the threshold of, you know, there were people who, and let's be honest about it, we don't need to be about fault and blame, uh, but there was a significant amount of population, and there was, it may still be, Karen, that will still say, boy, the gay people deserved everything they got. And you know what? I say that to people and they go, oh, and you know, I get it, but I hope you feel it because it's exactly the karma we invented to a degree with watching this disease spread. And, and we have to be okay with being honest about it without fault and blame because we can actually change it now. The, the medication today doesn't just keep me alive. It lowers my viral load to the point where I functionally and medically 100%, Karen, cannot spread the disease. So in the last year, science has come out and said, holy cow, if we tested people, put them on this medication, even the CDC says, we can actually end the disease in one calendar year. It's been 36 years and 37 million people are dead. And we actually physically, through our actions and accessibility to medication, can end the whole thing. And, but yet we're still not available to talk about it. You know, privacy and HIPAAs and whatever crazy thing you want to talk about. But we can't sit and have an honest dialogue about the fact that the parents of the people or, or the, the people 35 years ago who were first faced with this as adolescents, it's now their daughters being infected. And I doubt it's accidental. And we have to start being able to be okay and talking about it. So that was the passion of my book was, you know, most of these people diagnosed will hide in a corner. I'm sorry. Um, it's not something that you walk around with a t-shirt on, let's be honest. I think and, because it was um, seen as so contagious. I mean, the that, most contagious... Works. Yeah. The most contagious disease on earth is the flu. Hello. Right. I had the flu right. three times this year. Every time I got right. better, I went out into a crowd and came home with the flu again. I yeah. mean, that's the most contagious disease we yeah. can get. I, I don't know how contagious AIDS is. I think that that was pretty much hype and oh, fear yeah. and fear. Yeah, fear of not knowing. Absolutely. Fear, fear, fear. But let's get back to your story. So you died. <laughs> yeah. Imagine that. Because <laughs> we won't go into like this, the, the, the sickness of what you went through was like, you went through hell on earth, man, I tell you. And then you, and then you got out of here. It's like, yay, get out of that sick body. What happened? Come back, right? <laughs> Why did you come back? Yeah. <laughs> Why? Why? <laughs> well, it seems there was something important I was supposed to do. It and, seems like know, it. That, yeah. was the, that was the, you know, this was the furthest thing from my wheelhouse. I, you know, if you had asked me about a near-death experience, it would have been, you know, the life flashing before your eyes like we hear about, or maybe the tunnel or uh, the life review kind of thing. And, and it was furthest from the truth for me. I, um, when I was diagnosed in North Carolina, they gave me six weeks and, uh, Suddenly, the, the guy who was all about himself and his career and his future and going a thousand miles an hour, the only thing I thought about was, I want to be with my family. Um, and um, my wife went her separate ways, and I went into a bed. I was bedridden by then. And two weeks later, my family came and got me and transported me back to my home state to die. And that was important to me that I be surrounded by family. And you know, I, 
probably wasn't as fair to my family throughout my career as I should have been. I love them, but I was all too consumed with me. Um, but here I was, everything had changed. And uh, so I, I checked into a hospital in Burlington, Vermont. And um, a few days after that, I signed a DNR, a do not resuscitate. Um, and it was shortly after that, that I had my experience in intensive care where I there was this big black mass I found myself in as, as real as anything that me and you are even having today, maybe realer, uh, realer than real, I call it, wetter than water. And I could touch, I could feel, I could smell things, I could taste, and there was a humming and a vibration and one single light off in the distance that looked like a curved reddish glowing edge of something. Um, I wasn't sure if I traveled to it or it traveled to me. I don't try to make things up as I go. I just try to tell you what I felt and experienced. But almost instantly, I was on the edge of this red ribbon of light. And I remember thinking as I went to it almost instantly that it was the edge of a volcano. Right. Uh, and probably gave you an idea of my mindset. I, in, back in my hospital bed, I was, I was terminal for a couple reasons, probably three reasons, Karen. was, I had no immune system. I was loaded with opportunistic infections. So whether or not they could do something was another story. Two, I had no medical insurance. But this was right at the time of the Obamacare passing, ironically, while I was laying in intensive care. So lo and behold, I wake up and I all of a sudden, no pre-existing condition. Um, and three was shame. I mean, I was absolutely mortified. When I was told I was dying in North Carolina, my first response was, but I'm not gay. I mean, it's almost appalling. Uh, to find out today what's happened to the disease. But anyway, I'm standing on this red ribbon of light and lo and behold, below it, there was no lava, there was no fire and brimstone. And I was at the greatest peace I've ever experienced in my entire life, even to this degree. And I, I walk around like I'm on a cloud all day anyway. Um, but the vibration had increased, the taste, the, even there was a breeze. And, and below there was nothing except one tiny speck of light. And as I focused on it, because in a pitch dark world, standing on this red ribbon of light, which probably is synchronistic to the red ribbon of, of HIV, I, I find later in life, as I've looked at it, but um, nothing's changed on my experience. My interpretation of it has, though. Okay. But this one light started getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And as it did, so didn't the vibration, the humming that I could feel. Mm -hmm the odor, the taste in my mouth. Were you looking down at the light or was it in front of you? Down, it was more like right here in front of me. Right. Uh, but eventually it was, I would okay. say, huge. Yeah. It, was, it was pure, pure, pure white. Can't even define the white, whiter than snow. Uh, but there was movement in it in, in the sense that it had like blue streaks running through it tiny blue streaks showing motion uh, and it was actually counterclockwise. I, I don't know why I remember that, but I remember and, and I felt like a child. I was giggling and I wasn't scared. I was at great peace and I acted like a kid. Um, I wanted to touch it like a boy, probably uh, who knows. Um, but it was out of reach and, and it just got bigger. And in the center of this massive light was, all these blue streaks seem to go into this darker, little darker area centered, like a donut hole, uh, but not completely through. And everything went there. And every once in a while, it would squeeze down to look exactly like a donut. Um, it was just, I was so intuitive to watching everything. And there was a snapping and a crackling, and the breeze got louder, or the harder, the noise, the humming was louder. Uh, my hair was standing up. I could taste this taste that I still can't recreate. And the odor, I still haven't found that either. But Was it uh, sweet? Was it a sweet smell? Was it a nice smell? The odor. I've never heard anyone talk about the odor. 
Yeah, and you know what? It, originally, uh, when I first woke up from this experience, I thought I just had the most vivid dream ever, but I, it was always in the back of my mind. I don't remember tasting in a dream. I don't remember smelling in a dream. Um, the odor was like sweet, bitter, pungent, all at the same time. Does that Sounds like sense? India. <laughs> yeah, may, you know... <laughs> Have you ever smelled an ion machine, those ionization machines that blow out mm -hmm. some crazy ionization? It was actually very similar to that, but with like bleach. Now, that's the closest I've come, and I don't even think it's even close. Okay. Um, so it was just, uh, it was just odd and, and magically odd and fascinating to me. And I just had this big smile on my face and... Um, so anyway, the, the, the center of this thing eventually started, of course, forming a face. And I was like, come on, this isn't, you know, this is a great dream. I don't know what's happening. But eventually the face actually encompassed the entire white light. Um, the high points of the face, it was an older gentleman, obviously, with weathered appearance and face, elderly flowing hair down to his shoulders that's all i could see and and the details were defined in the same blue streaks that i had seen rolling around and i just was standing there and that's i guess at the point where my jaw dropped and i felt like i was standing in the face of god and boy did i want to touch that and uh, uh it seemed like forever it, uh, just, although I wasn't like, boy, you know, I got to go. It just was, the time sense was, was very odd to explain, but I try very hard in the book and so many more details in the book that are just, you can't get through it in an interview, but it's, um, I just was like a child. I keep saying that. And, uh, and, and, and then there were words from this man and uh, his voice, his lips never move. So I don't get that. I don't even try to pretend. Uh, but it was thunderous, and you could feel it in the marrow of your bones. It, it, and it was simple and without ambiguity. And I knew exactly where I was, and I knew exactly what was happening, and I still had that smile. And it, his, his, it was a question. Um, and back in my hospital bed, clearly the answer would be fairly well known, but the question was, are you ready? And uh, I mean, I didn't even question what are you talking? It was, I mean, I answered as quickly as he answered. I don't remember my lips <laughs> moving either, but anyway, I answered and, uh, and ironically, there wasn't even a thought or a pause. I said, no, I'm not. So it was three words to three words. And the irony was I really was. I had given up in my bed and was ready to go. And, and uh, But here I was, very so, assured that I wasn't ready. Okay, so are you ready to leave this exit, the matrix? Absolutely, no question in my mind. That you know, I what I'm thinking is I'm hearing this story. <laughs> and your guides are laughing with me. It's like... You know, how do we show people with an egoic mind where they're believing all their thoughts about who they are and what the world yeah. is? How do we show them the face of God? Oh we, God. Have to, we have to show them something that, you know, represents something that they're going to understand. So when you're saying it was an older man, he was weathered face, and I'm like, okay, because <laughs> our yeah. perception of God is some old dude, right? Usually some right. white guy. And, um, but that with was... the hair of Jesus. <laughs> Uh, you know, or a rock star, or one or the other. I don't know. I just, to me, I mean, this. There's no way I would have bought this as the as the cop. I mean, I've seen death in my life more than three lifetimes. Yeah, I bet you have as a cop. Veteran and a cop, yep. and, um, you know, I had gotten cold and insensitive to it, but here I stood, and I certainly believed in God. Uh, but but I, I'm sure that you had hallways of many churches. Let me, let I'm, me I'm sure that you exactly. But I don't know if you knew, like if somebody was to say, you know, what does God yeah. look like? Right. I mean, what do you say? I mean, really, yeah. it's just a, it's just a question that is so 
beyond it looks exactly or she potentially looks exactly like you think it should it exactly what you well, needed to you yeah well, yeah it, it looked exactly what to each of us it was it's exactly and, and all the experiences are so different it's really yeah. the after effects of these experiences yeah exactly yeah. Um, which i spend a lot of time talking about but you know i would have been the first skeptic dogmatic bastard to sit there at that light and go now you're crazy but there was absolutely no unequivocal question of where i was and what i was doing and what question i was answering absolutely zero there was no ambiguity um, okay so the light the light says no i'm not ready well you know? that's what i yeah that's the next question why did you say that i honestly don't know i yeah you do <laughs> Maybe that was the truth that, you know, you know, I suppose the next words out of his mouth and the last words of our conversation, what short it, it was, um, you know, it was three words from him. Are you ready? Three words from me. No, I'm not. And then the next words out of his mouth, followed by his smile, um, was the carrot I've chased ever since. And it was probably there that I realized why I said, no, I'm not. Um, and his words were, there's something important you're supposed to do. Uh -huh. uh, and, you know, your God potentially, right? You can't be more specific. I don't know. I mean, you don't have a post-it pad up there. You can't tell me what it is, really. Um, you know, but I've embraced that ambiguity with what is the important thing I'm supposed to do. But it, you know, I think it started right there with okay, realizing, Robert. realizing what I said, no, I'm not. I what? think it's the important thing we're all supposed to do. Yeah. Every human being on the planet. Yeah. I, I don't think, think it's specific right. to you. No. And that, and that is? If I hadn't have forgiven myself right there on that red ribbon of light, I wouldn't have made it past it. There was absolutely no question to me that stepping over that red ribbon was the point of no return. And had I said yes, I walked into the wonders of what my perception of heaven would have been. Um, but I let go of my shame standing on that light. Um, and and I, I guess I remember thinking, if anybody asks me why I got AIDS, it was because I loved too much and I'll be damned if I'm going to be ashamed of that. Um, and that's when I started fighting and, um, you know, there was movement and motion and next thing I knew I wake up in my bed and, and there was a ton of detail to his smile that really people should read about. It's, there was like, things happening and I could see through his face and light shining. It was crazy. And, but I woke up in my bed and I literally couldn't walk before that. I was in a coma and I woke up, got out of my bed, walked to the nurse's station, said, I need to see all my doctors. And my nurse even, you know, didn't even look up. She just was, yeah, uh, we can do that. And she, what the hell? And I, I need to see them all right now. And I walked back to my bedroom and of course everybody at that point was like, that guy couldn't even walk 10 minutes ago, was in a coma. Uh, so I walked back to my bed, got myself straightened out and waited for my doctors and they all came in and I, I told them, I'm, there's something important I'm supposed to do. So you tell me, all 12 of you, by the way, which I found ironical, um, and they stood around me in the same semicircle as that light and I went one by one and said, I need to do something important. What do we need to do? And I'm in. But had I not made that choice and, and found that committed level of let's get this thing done, you know, there, you, it, I wouldn't have made it past that point. Pure and simple. Mm -hmm. I mean, it wasn't without failures during, you know, the treatment. And, but I, that's when I first noticed something was different. You know, I, 12 doctors all took their turn. And I'm sure the liability was pouring out of them, right? But I never caught negatives. <clears throat> it was all positives. And I grabbed every little piece I could and said, let's go. 
And, you know, the next thing was I spent two weeks in rehab learning to walk again, although I had walked down to the nurse's station and demanded to see the doctors. So, you know, there was just the understanding that our unlimited potential. Unlimited. I, it, I just, the, yeah, pa it, the power of the decision, the power of the decision, there's just no underestimating the power no. of the decision. Nope. Uh, you know, before you, God said, are you ready? And you said, no, I'm not. You hadn't made a decision whether you wanted to live or die. You'd like, you were hanging on because you'd been through hell, but you were wow. still here. So, but the, the, then you're kind of going, I can do it. No, I can't. I can do it. No, I can't. I can do it. No, I can't. Which is, which is where a lot of us are in our life. You know, I want to be this. I can do it. No, I can't. I can do it. No, I can't. And like years ago, I was asked to, before I was a, healer i was a massage therapist young girl but i was doing some somewhat energy healing i massaged a woman who said my son's really really sick can you come and see him in hospital and when i got into the hospital he was like six foot four and 30 kilos which is just i know you guys don't do kilos but he was a skeleton with some skin on it in a bed and he'd had sepsis and uh i thought what does she want me to do this guy because i can't massage him <laughs> So I actually had a talk with him. I channeled it, as you do, but I didn't know I was doing it. I'm a young girl. And I actually asked him to make a decision to live or die. Yeah. And I told him he had a choice, that he could do yeah. that. You know, when I say it was me, it wasn't even me speaking. It was someone speaking through me because I just looked at this person and I said, what am I going to do? And then I was given what I was going to do. And then I did some Reiki on him and he made the decision. I came back to see him a couple of days later and the nurses all ran up to me and said, what did you do to this man? What did you do? boy he was a boy and I you know I couldn't really explain to them what I did but I said oh I did Reiki and they're like oh we have to all learn Reiki but that's not what happened what happened was he made a decision yeah. and he started healing as soon as he made that decision yeah. and within weeks he had put on like kilos and he was a different person yeah. within within five days he was a different person yeah you know, and, and the same, I guess, with me. I mean, by the time I was, you know, the thing was I had signed a DNR, a do not resuscitate. Yeah. And there was some aspect of me that was dealing with the shame of my diagnosis. Honestly. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it, it was awful and morbid. It's just horrific. And, you know, there was never a time in my life or in many that I watched it that another human could be in, could be sicker. And yeah. what we did know was I had no functioning immune system. Yeah. Um, I was loaded with opportunistic infections like a tuberculosis like disease. I mean, there, there were, this wasn't like, you know, you got to hang, you know, it was awful. And it, they told me it would be a year and a half at least of a chemo like treatment that would be horrific. And, uh, but you're right. I made that choice and every day became a gift. And, yeah. but I immediately noticed changes. I mean, I wrote about them in my confusion of understanding and I could feel things from people and yeah. Yeah, you came back like most. Oh, and oh my like, God, I, was, I thought I was going crazy. But yeah, you had the I, empathy. I was so busy with trying to you know, just get through each day, I really didn't give a crap. Uh, but I wrote 15 pages of changes in, in just me physiologically. My blood pressure lowered, my pulse lowered. My, even my body temperature today is a steady 95.8 degrees. And most people are, I have, if you walk in and don't tell a doctor that they freak, you know, that's. Is that awesome. high or low? I don't know. Cause I'm, you're in, well, you're in Fahrenheit. 98.6. Uh, so you're Celsius. So um, right. yeah, for Fahrenheit, it's 98.6. I'm 95.8 across the board. So you're low. Oh man. It's almost hypothermic. Right. But uh, it's steady as a rock and my blood pressure is a hundred over 50 and you know, that's alarming if you didn't, you know, so you have to like prepare doctors for what you've been through. And I started becoming allergic to medication and you know, the irony of one of the things I don't talk about a lot is, and I, I just forget, I guess is I, I probably block it out, but you know, for a guy six years later, I have a quarter of your immune system. If yeah. yours is fully functioning. Yeah. Uh, and I'm allergic to almost every known antibiotic to man. And people are like, well, what the hell do we do with that? And, and that's the irony of it is, 
I don't even need the antibiotics. Yeah. But I do need a proper mindset. And yes. And it, and it really isn't, I can sit down and I don't do a Reiki. I don't meditate. I don't even really pray. Uh, my time is outdoors 24 hours a day and almost uh, I go to bed and I sleep hard. I get up quick. But there's a few common denominators that I do that, that, that really, you know, the question really is for doctors, how do you do it without an immune system? We don't even, I don't know what to tell you. Um, and I don't either, and I don't pretend to, but I, I do talk about the things I do differently than what I used to do. Um, but I think that might be one of the secrets is I think new experiences are the key to healing almost anything. And it, it's, you can't heal as we've heard in the same environment you got sick in. And I was constantly challenged to change my environment or at least my perception of it clearly changed. I mean, I, when I woke up from my NDE, as sick as I was, I found beauty in everything. Beauty. Everyone, you found beauty in everything. Everything. And it was almost to the point of people going, yeah, his baloney fell off the cracker. Um, <laughs> but I mean, I just knew that everything was a gift. Everybody who I encountered had something for me and me for them. And it wasn't one thing. It was multiple things. So in a time of my life when people ran, I grabbed a hold of the few that stood up and showed up. And it was, you know, people have said, well, are you some kind of hero? And I always respond with the same thing. Absolutely not. But I'm surrounded by many of them. And it was the people who showed up and stayed and gave me, whether it be 20 seconds of their time or or hours of it, I, I absolutely ate it with a spoon. And I believe it's what saved me. It wasn't antibiotics, clearly. I'm allergic to most of them. It, um, I mean, I've had MRSA three times. I've had- MRSA? What's, oh, what's, yeah. what's MRSA? Um, resistant staph infection. Oh. Uh, so uh, it's resistant to antibiotics. Um, I've had shingles four times. I mean, the list is countless. But it isn't that you survive all those things. The question still comes up, how do you do it without an immune system? And it, it, functionally, the body shouldn't be able to do it, let alone the mind. Uh, but it did every time. And it really came down to what was the attitude while I waited. Consciousness, consciousness, consciousness. Yeah. If only, doc you know, I think you're a walking, talking, living example of how consciousness creates you know the doctors are all have their heads in the science and yeah. uh, and are looking at you know i studied as a doctor and a naturopath and i found it all really fascinating but i heard my teacher saying over and over again well you know science can't explain this and it can't explain that and it can't explain i mean we have no idea what's really going on and the reason that we can't explain it from a physical perspective is because we're not talking consciousness no. And and you've just said, I woke up and I saw beauty and everything. I was so grateful for a, the, mm -hmm. the, the, tiniest, the tiniest bit of attention anyone gave me. And that feeling, that frequency of gratitude yeah. and appreciation, yeah. like that's healing right it was there. It was it's everything. everything. Yeah. It's everything in a time when we're divided a little bit more than we should, maybe the whole secret was just the opposite. Yeah. Not the pill you well, took. But it, it, it certainly was the mindset of the pill you took, but at the same time, it was connectivity. It was community. It was unity. Feeling connect unity. Yeah. Well, he gave you, or she gave you, or they gave you, or it gave you, whatever you want to call God. Uh, a, a healthy dose of um, I don't know what you call it. It's what it's what all NDEs experience. It's what all healers have. It's that empathic, psychic knowing. It's like an expanded. Oh boy! I don't even know what to call it. You know, I went to see John of God years ago in Brazil. That healer and. I wasn't sick. I was a young, healthy girl, and uh, but I wanted to be a healer. And what I came out with was this, this expanded feeling, yeah. 
knowing yeah. psychic sense. It's not like I wasn't doing it before. It was just exponentially expanded, which, yeah. as you say in your book, is really difficult to navigate in a third dimensional world when you're feeling everyone's pain and their, everyone's thoughts. And I couldn't go to the supermarket. I felt every advertising. Yeah. I felt everything. Yeah. It's not easy. And I didn't ask for any of it. So, <laughs> well, you kind of did. <laughs> I played the victim card for a while. At first, it was what the hell is going on? You know, you, you, and I think there's all millions of us out there. You don't have to die to have a spiritual awakening. Yeah. It, it, level of your after effects is probably in direct proportion to it. But I mean, you can have a, a, a massive session of grief and it can wake you yeah. up to. Um, and that's the thing we're finding today is, you know, last year we did a, a study um, nationally that 54% of the American population has now had a spiritually transformative event. Imagine that's, that. Thank God. <laughs> it's a majority now. You know, we used to be the quiet whispers in the corner. Look at that weird guy. Uh, but, you know, now we're a majority and it's increasing exponentially. But yeah, I mean, I talk a great deal about the after effects because it, it uh, I mean, I want to be real about it. I read a lot of people's NDE stories. I don't really, but I hear about them. And, you know, I woke up and life was grand and everything was beautiful and merry-go-round and life forever after was great. And that just, I'm sorry that uh, my life is a gift every day. Don't get me wrong. But these after effects are rampant, they are furious, and they're serious in their intention. Yeah. They're telling you something. And if you don't figure it out, and it isn't just one thing, it's multiple things. So you constantly are paying attention to the synchronicities of the world um, and the gifts that every... So nothing changes, it just gets bigger. And the real question has always been, well, how do you facilitate it back into the normal world. And I think to myself, why the hell would I? Why would I go back into a box when I realized that it, the box really never existed and the limits were absolutely potential to what the human beings can do? And God help us all if we don't ever come to the realization that it isn't just what a human being can do, but when we unite, holy cow. And, you know, everything's about dividing us now. And it's yeah. not an accident. You know, it's really not an accident. And we need to pay attention to it. I want to go back to what you said. What's it telling you? You know, coming back with the after effects, what's it telling you? And somebody asked me, just two things happened in the last couple of days. Somebody asked me the other day, you know, as an empath and a psychic, and how do you protect yourself from feeling other people's pain and other people's trauma and other people's yeah. negative shit, right? How do you protect right. yourself? And yeah. it's really easy. Raise your vibration. That's what yeah. it's telling us to do. Yeah. Raise your vibration. What does that mean? It means yeah. forgiving people that you've got shit on. It yeah. means be happy. Get happy. It means yeah. forgiving yourself. It means getting over your own crap. It means loving your life, raising your vibration, raising. And that is the message. Everything that we're talking about on every, every person I talk to on every show, that's the message. Raise your vibration. Raise your vibration. Absolutely. It, it absolutely is. Um, you know, but I think there's one thing to mention on that deal too is, you know, when I came back, I didn't get at first when I was dealing with the after effects before I even knew what they were. Yeah. I was getting downloads for people with all of their crap. Yes. It wasn't, it wasn't the prom date or the marriage or the birth of their children. It was the car accidents, the mental abuse, the physical abuse, the sexual abuse. I mean, it was the irony of it all of a man who saw beauty in everything, but could feel your dirt. Yes. It was a constant trial for me to be able to look past that the understanding and absolute absorption of the fact that we are all flawed. Yeah. And it is at that, that I find the biggest beauty. And, yeah. and you know, we rationalize it away, I think today, but it's, so that Robert, was not something I was like, obviously. I mean, there were so many changes. Yeah. What did you say to people when you could see that? Did you tell them? And if you did, did they, did they slap you on the face and say, shut up, are you not supposed to see that? Or, I mean, what was no. going on? No, and the irony, it was very few. And for the first six months after 
I realized actually what had happened and I was having try and I've been an extrovert all my life. I yeah. you know, walked to a party. I was, yeah. knew I was there. Yeah. Uh, suddenly I'm like, I, there were colors and energies and data dumps of crazy crap. I didn't want, I literally went crazy to crap. a cabin in a mountain for seven months and in the dead of winter in Vermont and hibernated until I found ways to, control and manage what was happening exactly and and the best way i found was when i found community um you know the irony of my story was it was two years after this great man and this this dude in the light telling me dude there's something important you're supposed to do without being specific by the way um it was two years later at christmas and my family was all gathered around and my mom's passing out her annual Christmas calendar, which we all fight for the cover position. And surely two years I survived hospice. I'm going to be on the cover, but I wasn't. Uh, but ironically, I opened to my month birth year and she always puts pictures and you know everybody's anniversaries and dates. So on this calendar month of my birthday for this two years, almost two years to the date of my near death experience, I still hadn't even figured out what had happened to me. I just knew I was weird. That's what I kept calling myself. Um, I opened this calendar. There's four pictures. One grainy black and white picture. Don't even have a clue. Never seen it in my life. And there's a man. And I started hyperventilating. I fell to my knees crying. That picture of that man was the same face I saw in the light in my experience that I had told a few of them about. That man was my grandfather who Your had grandfather. died 22 years before I was even born. There you go. Your that was the pivotal moment of, holy, excuse my French, holy shit. Holy crap. <laughs> yeah, sorry if I've got to bleep that out, but it's uh, That's a know, fun. Google. I had the vivid dream, and I've changed, and I, it was some dead guy in a light, and you pretty much will get to near-death experience. So. When I found community, ironically, probably not, um, is when I found control over my after effects. Right. I, you know, that was, I'm not alone. Yeah. There are millions of people out there dealing with the same crap I'm dealing with. Totally. And it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. You know, I had a client here yesterday and she said something really interesting. You know, her awakening was a ayahuasca ceremony she has had many of them i think it's an important one yeah and she's kind of done you know in ayahuasca what people because as i'm listening to her i'm thinking oh my god this is what my nde is say you know right but then she said something because she was corporate successful um businesswoman of the year you know celebrated her husband had died and she had um looked after her children like like a like a superstar and then life like slaps her up the face as it does and kind of wakes her up out of her ego and there was nothing wrong with her ego it was like survival it was like survival but anyway and then she's like she looks at me and then she says but how do you integrate that back into the matrix it was such a beautiful way of expressing it yeah. How do you integrate what you've experienced back into the matrix, into the third dimensional matrix? What did she you said, me? you know, that's, that's, that's the journey she's going through right now. And, and it, it baffles me why we think we need to integrate back into anything. Well, it's like, how do you come back into integrating to us is really the real question. Maybe we should all be asking. Say that again. Why aren't, why isn't the other, you know, if we know spiritually transformative events are 54% of our population, why the hell aren't they integrating to our side instead of us having to fit back into theirs? That's the yeah. real irony of it to me. I'm curious what you told her to do. Well, yeah. Well, interestingly enough, you know, here's the thing that you, you, you change and then you bring your changes back into the matrix and then you change the matrix. Right. You don't fit back into the matrix. You don't get the corporate job and be the same person you were before. If you do go back, at, if you do go back into the corporate world, you calm with your woo-woo. I mean, this is, just, this is just so... I wrote this blog and I sent out my newsletter yesterday, you know, own your woo-woo. Own it. Yeah. Own yeah. it. 
tell people you can see their thoughts and their oh fears and their dead relatives standing behind them. And you go back into the corporate world three did times. Did you? Did you? And, you know, you could say maybe too early, too whatever. But the reality was, you know, I still barely had an immune system, still barely do. But I went back to the automobile industry three times with my new gifts. Yes. This is going to be a slam dunk, right? I mean, I was good at what I did before. Now, if I know what you're thinking, you're done. I got cancer all three times within 90 days of going back. Yeah. Each time. So, you know, and I might be a slow learner <laughs> or a stubborn, stubborn old man. But at the same time, I kept going back. I would, I'd be in surgery within two weeks. I would rush to get healthy again. I ran back again. Three times I did it. All three times I ended up on the surgical table having chunks of my body removed. Well, that's definitely a message. It took that a while to learn. Stop selling cars and start, uh, you know, right. start selling books. Yeah. But, <laughs> but, you know, that's not, that's not everyone's journey because I, I really feel that once you've had your spiritually transformative experience, you need to take that message back into life. You can't retreat yeah. from life. There are some people like you who need to do something different. You know, you know you've got to stop selling cars. So I, I suspect it was my thought of that, that looming carrot I've always chased, Karen, which was there's something important you're supposed to do. And I'm pretty damn sure it wasn't taking your money over the next Jeep Cherokee on the car lot. You know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, let's be honest. Uh, you know, and I don't think it was the book. I don't think, you know, there's, you know, recently we just got the state of Arizona to pass an open legislation to change how we handle HIV and hep C in this state. It's right. landmark. It's right. never been tried. Uh, and it was because I built a platform of, there we go again, that unity from my book and, and my avocation and just my spirituality of gaining a collective of people united as one to make change in this world and we're doing it. And I don't even think that's the important thing. You know, the irony of what I think the important thing I'm supposed to do is what everything, everything. Maybe it's just that simple. You know, I don't half ass anything and, and I tackle everything with a passion and an absolute belief. I've survived the impossible. You have, and you're still surviving the impossible. Absolutely tell me, Oh, like you can't do that. Really? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> really? Maybe <laughs> that's the important thing is to understand that there is absolutely nothing without, absolutely nothing outside of our grasp as a human being. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Estes Hicks says that too. You know, she says that the only reason when you chop someone's arm off, it doesn't grow back is because you don't believe it will. And, he's, uh, and she said, right. yeah. yeah. And she said, you know, if, if you, if you, knew that you could do that it would happen yeah i mean we keep we keep going oh man that's another miracle yeah <laughs> really <laughs> really you know the, if you look at the definition of a miracle it just can't be defined that way anymore you know i but Marianne. i enjoy with the ego of of that still exists in me and in, in understanding that i still did it all without an immune system and it really pisses off doctors yeah, I love that you piss off doctors. It's yeah. like, woohoo. They have no scapegoat to say, oh. They have no scapegoat. Well, you're, a bit like, you're a bit like even Alexander who defied, you know, defied the, the medical norm. But, you know, Marianne Williamson defines miracle from a shift in perspective from fear to love. I totally agree with that. Yeah. And I wondered, and I've quoted that several times. It's funny where I'm supposed to chat with her about uh, she had a lot to do with HIV and AIDS. You know, did I she did not know that years Why? ago? And of course, Louise Hayes, and, and you know, there's been so many who have come and go through that process of, uh, of trying to when, for for that disease. It's um, it's amazing. So when I asked I my thought, guides about was it just finding that love was the answer? Could it be that simple? Yeah. When I, I when I asked my guides about the specifics of AIDS, like why are there so many different diseases? You know, why is there cancer versus AIDS and this versus that? And um, they say they all have a different quality of uh, experience 
And I said, well, what was the AIDS thing all about? And they said, all right, well, if you imagine a soul wanting to choose an experience to really work with in a specific lifetime, right. they said it's about shame. You bet. 100%. Yeah, so, I mean, that was my experience standing yeah. on that red light, that if I yeah. hadn't let that go, shame. and it wasn't completely, I still dealt with it and I still deal with whether or not I want to admit it or not, I still have family who've turned their back and, and I've had them reach out and say, do not talk to my friends about your avocation. And so there are still hurtful things, but I, you know, and I take a shot in the kidneys and I get back up like I always do. And, and eventually some synchronistic thing happens to them where they kind of go, oh, man, was I, you know, I, you weren't a human being, you were a disease. And, but it's still tough. I mean, if you think it's tough raising money for this disease, that's basically nobody wants to talk about. It. It's almost impossible on an individual basis. Yeah. You know, I'm followed by over 200,000 people and I run the fundraising campaign. I've had 55 people donate money. And you know what our donation thing is, Karen? It's called give a buck, $1 from every human being, 55 people. So you've, you've raised $55? Nope. I've actually, some, most people actually went way over the dollar. Right. Um, oh. Which is amazing in the miracle in and of itself. But mm. the, the reality is, I mean, we scroll things, past things faster than, you know, Carter's got liver pills anyway. But especially on a disease that's 35 years old that we've been kind of accustomed to ignoring is not our problem. But when I stand in front of 500 people talking around the world and say, Anybody know the fastest growing population of new HIV infections is women 13 to 24 years old. There are less than two people out of 500 who even know that. So when you educate normal, even spiritual people sitting in a room of 500 people, they get enraged and they damn well should. It's time that the gay population not be the only one towing this thing up the hill. Yeah. I've tried it for 35 years. It's not, it's not doing it. It's time that we all collaborate together. So that's well, been my message for sure. I think that the gay population, it, it hit the population because they were probably dealing with this shame thing, yeah. you know, because yeah. the Bible says it's a sin to be gay. Of course. And so then you wake up, you know, you find yourself and it's not a choice, as they say, okay. and then they're yeah. just living inside shame. Maybe yep. that, that quality of shame, which is a very dense vibration, is the is the um the the what's the word i'm looking for is what creates the aids thing because yeah. i i don't think it's a virus i think you know your body has to hold a vibration in order for disease to flourish and it has to hold a vibration in order for health to flourish too and you're um, absolutely right we i mean we've had spontaneous remission on every disease known to man except absolutely one, except one hiv and aids there has never been one. There has been one well, cured person from HIV and he got a stem cell transplant. Oh, he got a stem cell. The, the question comes into play and he died 12 months later from leukemia. Right. But the, the question still comes into play. How much did the shame and belief of whether you could or couldn't have to do with that? Oh, yeah. You know, totally. Years ago, cancer wasn't, you couldn't survive that. You either. couldn't survive cancer. Watching it every day. Exactly. And still calling it miracles, but nonetheless, it's still happening every day. So but that's the paradigm. How much does the shame have to do with it? It's a huge component to it. And it was Louise's passion, as you know, Louise. Lu exactly. I mean, her career started with six HIV patients in her living room. Exactly. That's how her career started. Yeah. And it's why I chose my publisher, ironically, Balboa Press, a division of Hay House. Yeah. Um, so, you know, there's been a lot. Of, I always pay attention to synchronicity. Yeah. And even our meeting was synchronistic or, or united in a certain way. And then we got together and we're like, oh, man, are we are like brother and sister. <laughs> so it's Every day I'm, I still would love to be able to say I'm not amazed by it, but every day I absolutely am. I meet somebody for, and I absolutely know why. I don't even know necessarily know why, but I know that it was important that we met. And yeah. I know once you get in the flow in the flow, in the flow of pure positive energy. Life is just a constant, 
constant stream of synchronistic moments. It's just one after the other, after the other. It's just, it's, they're no longer a surprise because they, they, I just expect them like the next person. So I'm, I'm helping a friend shut down her business, business that I adore and I'm helping her clean out. Um, and I find a passport and, um, I say, you know, she was too busy to find the person that owned it that's been left behind. So I said, let me take, this is an important document. Let me take this and give this back to this person. And I do. And I wasn't even thinking about it being a synchronistic meeting. I was just thinking, this person needs to get their passport back. And of course, it is a completely synchronistic meeting, you know. And, and you know, she spends two hours in my house chatting and, and uh, yeah. Hello, doggy. Yeah. How long have we been speaking? Well, we've been speaking probably for about an hour. That's all right. I wanted to say, look, I had a couple of things out of the book, uh, out of the book quotes. Mark Twain once said, whenever you find yourself on the side of the majority, it's time. It's time to put the dog outside. Yeah, it's time to get the dog outside. <laughs> Mark Twain once said, whenever you find yourself on the side of the majority, it's time to pause and reflect. I thought that was a beautiful quote out of your book story of my life yeah trust your instincts they will always be right that's how magnificent we are do not fear those who judge you as being outside the normal box there is no box i love that there's no box being is called crazy by those who are still victims of a cultural conditioning is a compliment oh that, that's what i love being called crazy by those who are still victims of a cultural conditioning is a compliment, says Jason Har what, what, Harriston. I totally agree. Yeah, yeah. I love it. Being yeah, called I think cognitive bias is a big is one of the big issues and in, in diseases of our time. I think it's that and indifference that are fueling a good portion of of what we deal with is illness. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the ability to heal that cognitive bias is it's still it says here, spiritual, you know. People ask me why I saw what I saw in the light. I, I saw my grandfather. Why other millions of faces and what the heck the light was. Did you see millions of other faces? I did when his smile, and I didn't get into it, but when his smile after I said, you know, no, I'm not ready and, the, and something important I'm supposed to do, he smiled. Right. And his face cracked and lights kind of shone through him. And, and, I, and his face like transformed. Over. It was, you know what I call it? It, it? Did you ever see the Michael Jackson video where the guy's faces just keep revolving? Yeah, yeah. Just like that. I'm sorry mm -hmm. to be so commercial about it. But it, it was like his face became everybody's. And it was like I was there forever. And then eventually mm -hmm. it dissipated. And I could see below him and there were valleys and trees and rivers and little specks of things. And, and, and then it was gone like that. I was moving backwards or it moved away from me. I still don't know, but yeah, there were a million billions probably of faces. It seemed like it was endless. I guess it was just a message of unity. We're all one. Yeah. We are all one. The one in the many and the many in the one. It's been the absolute, you know, beautifully haunting part of my experience has been, and, I, and I'm not alone. It, it's the majority of near-death experiencers, as it turns out, coincidentally, probably not, is that we come back with a oneness that we just can't seem to shake. Yeah, exactly. That we can't stop talking about. And, and, you know, we still have the cognitive biases of how we grew up and our sense of competition, but I, I just, you know, if you're not collaborating in life, you're competing. And, yeah. and I absolutely understood on a mortal plane. It's not competition. Isn't it? It's a healthy and fun and a game. This is not a game. And if you're collaborating, you're surviving. It, it's, we've always been better in our numbers. It's been the facet of our human evolution. Yeah. It doesn't just go away. In fact, it, there's no way. It's one of the most prevalent common after effects of a near death or even a spiritual awakening as we come back. We may not be able to define it, explain it, outline it, draw it, but there's a oneness that will not leave us alone. Why? Yeah. It's not a mass delusion. It, mm -hmm. You know, we didn't 
I didn't go there with it. I came back with it, and millions of us did. And it, it, this isn't a mass delusion. There's something mm -hmm. that needs to be paid attention to. And it's not just the, our experiences. In fact, I, you know, most people want to read about the glitter and the guy and the light and what, you know, that's a holy cow moments. <laughs> but I think the holy cow moment is an understanding that millions of us have had these diverse, different experiences. But we all come back thinking, doing, acting, even on the same time frame as each other. And that's the part we've got to pay attention to. If you're looking for proof of God in your near-death experience or somebody else's, I think you've got to look at the after effects. It's too synchronistic. It, it is not a, this is not a Kool-Aid drinking event here, guys. We all come back. We don't read each other's stuff even, and we all believe the same thing at the same time. It's not accidental. Robert Tramway, it's been so beautiful to chat with you today. Any last insights you want to leave our listeners? Oh, don't waste a damn minute. You know, I mean, I don't know if this is, this is one common denominator I do every day. And it wasn't about, sometimes it's just about remembering, changing what human conditioning was. So here's how I do it. I go out of my way to see sunrises and sunsets. That's my meditation. I don't do the proverbial, oh, you know, I just don't do it. Um, I've always been an out of the box kind of guy, but my sunrises and sunsets are, are moments of my life that I think change everything for me, even on a rough day. Uh, but you know, the ironic part is every morning when the sun first hits my face every day, I just say thank you. I don't know where I got it. I don't. I didn't even pray for a cure for my disease. The only thing I ever prayed for was mercy. That's it. And I found it. And, and you know, it's in every given moment of every given day. And some days you got to dig for the gratitude a little bit more, but it's all around you. You just, it's the attitude while you wait for sure. So please. You know, we all think we've got time, but it's a 20 second moment that can change everything in your life. So man, you just grab it, you shake it for all it's worth and you waste none of it. That would be the only advice or thing I would ever tell another human being about, uh, about my experience if they're, you know, and again, we all need to have our own experiences. I just... Yeah. I, for the first year of my, after my experience, wish to God I could stop people from having it, but it's not the way it is. Mm -hmm. And you just got to suck the marrow out of it. it. It is absolutely every minute of every day can be magnificent. It's up to you. So you feel grateful for everything that's happened to you, even though you've been dragged through the ringer and to hell and back. I think Ever. even the, the negativity, you know, I'm not the guy who, creeps into the corner and meditates and prays it away. I face it. I deal with it. You, you know, the funny thing is, and I don't believe it, it please pray, please meditate. I, it's beautiful. But life is a spiral. This stuff will keep coming up over and over and over. And the thing about a spiral is it gets thinner at the end. So you will get faster and quicker until you slam into something. Our prayers and our meditation, the power we find in those moments, is the fact the real answer to your prayers is more often than not that you can get off your ass and do something about something. Do it. Get up and get involved. Community. The irony of me being in hospice for two months, I walked out of hospice after two months. You want to know what I did every day in hospice? I volunteered. I was barely hanging on, and I found ways to go volunteer. Not by conscious choice. I was drawn to it. That wasn't an accident. Give to other people and you will receive so much more. It's just that simple to me. Because there's only one of us in the room. Right. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> and my dog. He's me too. <laughs> right. He or she. Indeed. He is indeed. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, people ask, did you touch the face of God? Sure, I did. Might have turned out to be the physical manifestation of my grandfather, but to me, it was the face of God. 
You yeah. know, all my life I've reached to the stars, to aspiring to be something better every day. This time I just reached a little further. Exactly. Robert, it's just been so beautiful. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> we got it. We got it going after an hour or so. And um, right. just tell people your website who are listening on audio. Yeah, uh, there's a couple of, of course, 20seconds.net is our book, uh, which it's discounted on. You can find our book everywhere, Amazon, Barnes and Nobles. Um, we've started a publishing company, tremorbooks.com. So we are trying to change uh, the face of publishing a little bit with indie publishing and uh, making it easier for others to find their voice. Uh, but our true passion, I guess, everything funnels down to Gab Incorporated, G-A-B. Uh, that's our passion. A portion of every book goes towards Gab, and that is our our movement to change. Is now we applied for our 501c, um, and that goes to advocating for against infectious diseases. and And right now, our current passion is changing this law in Arizona, uh, and that's the first state of 50 to go. Uh, <laughs> and it could literally, absolutely save millions of lives, and we are. Some days I have to pinch myself to realize that it wasn't me that walked in by myself to that Senate office countless times and got it done. It was my platform. Uh, again, it was the unity that mm. gave me the opportunity to stand in front of them and say, we can change this and end it right now. And uh, we're on our way. So if people go and visit uh, gabinc.org, um, they can donate or buy crystals and rocks or tie dyes. There's a hundred different ways to donate or help us. Uh, but mostly we just look for people to collaborate with us in any way, whatever gift they give us, whether it's 20 seconds or a post share or, or just a keep going. And uh, it saved me repeatedly and will continue to. Beautiful, beautiful. And if you want to support the show, I put a link, my Amazon link on my website page. And no one's ever used it. I've been doing it for five years now. I never earned a cent. But anyway, maybe someone will one day. <laughs> I never actually tell anyone to do it. <laughs> I've got these Amazon links to all the books and I've never made a cent out of it. But anyway, you, 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 live, in, you live in hope, don't you? Uh, thanks again, Robert. It was a pleasure, Karen. Bye for now. Thank you. Take care of yourself. That again, I've got the recording on again. Say that again. Oh, the two parts of, of actually evolving as a human being are, one, new experiences, which in, in our comfort zones and our routines are rarely happening today. And every time we get out of it, we're like, holy cow. And the second way is, is actually fundamentally admitting when you're wrong. And, and we know how often that happens today. So I often think to myself, why the hell are you fighting being right? when really one of the biggest aspects of actually evolving as a species and a human being and just being better than you were yesterday, the only way you actually learn something new other than new experience is to say, yeah, I was wrong. Yeah, and and Grace I, being wrong. Come on, that's huge information. If you were taught that to begin with, imagine. Yeah, that's how you know that you're, yeah, as you said, evolving. That's how you know you're, in, you're changing. Is that t today you feel differently about something than you did yet? Like, I was wrong. Yes, I was right. wrong. Yeah. I think we kind of look at that evolution as, well, from primate to this. Well, <laughs> no, any evolution is just being different than where you were yesterday. And yeah. I think we evolve no matter what we do. But if you really want to have these massive holy cow moments, you actually have to embrace being wrong. You know what I mean? You just, yeah. that's the only way you're going to allow it. You just can't expand as a human being defending a position. Mm -hmm. I, I often say, stop taking a position, take an interest. <laughs> it, it's just too damn hard to evolve defending your position. Yeah. If you take an interest, you just might actually learn something new. But, you know, our whole society isn't built that way. Even our politicians stand up there and say, yes, I've been perfect all my life. You know, at some point, our society has to even stand up and say, you know what? I want somebody flawed. I want somebody who's fallen. 
and, and even when I hired people, if there was two people, one was perfect on their resume and one had some scrapes and bumps and errors, I went with that one every time. I don't want your perfection that, God help you, we're all going to fall. But I don't know if you can get back up. This guy I know can get back up and he can thrive. That's my choice in political candidates, in doctors, in, in friends. I want real. I don't want your pretend. Because if you're trying to stand there and tell me you've never failed at life, you haven't tried enough. <laughs> you haven't lived. <laughs> Sorry. Or you're just damn well not telling the truth. And I want real in my life. I want flawed. I want dirty. I want the real. And you're not alone. You know, I, I, I once knew this guy that was this multimillionaire. He was a friend of my mum's, and I went up and he owned an island. He's since passed. Uh, but I went up and worked on his island and I used to hang out with him. And he was the big boss and everyone was scared of him. And he, he used to say exactly that. He used to look at me and say, I hate those sniveling people that are always so scared of me. And I want people that tell me the truth. So when one of his employees used to say, no, Keith, that's crap. You've got it all wrong. He really admired that. He admired they had the balls. So true. So true. Yeah. I supervise people since I was 20 years old. And, and you know, those are the people I went. I just, you couldn't help but laugh at it. And you actually learn something from that. Regardless of your supervisory role, you deal with life. You'll live a hell of a lot longer. Guarantee it. That's right. Authenticity is the key. Yep. Another incredible show. Isn't Robert the most beautiful man? Isn't he just gorgeous? I tell you what, I've chatted to him a little bit, you know, off off camera and uh it's just he's just amazing. He's got so much wisdom and so much light inside him, which of course keeps him alive because he as he says he's got like no immune system. So He's a walking, talking miracle. And if you got anything out of this conversation today, I hope you, you got the message of gratitude that if you learned anything that was going to change your life, it is to say thank you for all of it. Thank you for the pain. Thank you for the good times. Thank you for the bad times. Thank you. The attitude of gratitude is in the most powerful vibration, frequency you can evoke. Thanks again for joining us. And remember, if you want to join our little Inner Sanctum webinar series, I say this every time, please do so. We talk a lot about this sort of thing and so much more. Or if you want a personal session from me and my guides, finding out who you are, what your message to the world is, please contact me on karenswain.com. Love you all. Thanks again. Bye for now. Thanks so much for joining us for another enlightened conversation on Accentuate the Positive. If you would like spiritual guidance from my guides, Blissful Beings, go to karenswain.com for a reading or to listen to more enlightened thought leaders share their wisdom. Go to the listen page on karenswain.com and choose who you want to listen to. All the podcasts are also available on iTunes. Remember to check us out on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest, you name it, we're there. Until next time, bye for now. If you feel like that's what you want.